And I'm Lynn Gordon. I'm Associate Dean for Diversity and Professor in Ophthalmology. And we will probably be joined by two other faculty members so that we can do sort of a bit of a dialogue. As I said earlier, we're going to have a small group today. And um, that's OK. Uh, for those of you who have colleagues that may have wanted to come but couldn't, um, not only do we do the live streaming now, and we may have um, people doing live streaming, streaming on computer that we can't see. This is Harbor. Uh, we, I think we're, I'm not sure whether people from Harbor are going to attend today's session, but we may have people tuning in on computer as well, so that when you ask a question or have a comment, I'm going to repeat it. Um, or we can pick up the mics and then they will hear it, I think. Um, and then for those people who want to at least see slides afterwards, um, we usually post things or we'll post the video on the web. So I thought maybe we'll, we'll just get started because I don't want to penalize people that are here on time. So when we think of work-life balance, one of the things we need to think about is what is your primary job? And so we've all sort of introduced ourselves. I'm not sure what my primary job is because I wear sort of three hats. I wear the hat of the Associate Dean for Diversity. I also wear a clinical hat, so I see patients two half days or three half days a week. And I have a research hat because I have an R01 funded research program. So depending upon the hour of the day, the day of the week, the time of the night, I may be wearing one hat or another hat. And I think we've heard from you all as you introduced yourselves about what you consider your primary hat to be. So when you think of work-life balance, what comes to mind? Anybody? What sort of things would you put in a talk on work-life balance? If you were creating a talk on work-life balance, what would, be, what would the topics be? What are topics that are important to you? I don't always feel like I have enough time to be nicer to my kids. <laughs> OK, not enough time to be nicer to my kids. OK, anybody else? Uh-oh. Do, Spending more time. How to create the balance between all of the demands on you at work and demands on you outside of work. OK, very good. Hello, one of our guest uh, faculty. Um, any other um, issues that are important in terms of work-life balance? How many of you have children? OK. And um, of those who have children, are they, are they uh, anybody um, an empty nester? I'm the only one. Um, it has totally changed my life in good ways and in bad ways. So I had 27 years of children at home until this year. And um, my 27-year-old has been out of the house for a number of years, which I consider is a good thing. But, uh, but my youngest son just went off to college this year. So that totally changed my home demands when he went off. But many of you might have children in grade school or children in nursery school, or children in high school. And some of us don't have children. So this is not just a female issue. This is not just a male issue. It's not just for people with children or without children. But when I think about work-life balance, I think of partner, spouse, significant others. I think of parents, especially as you get older our, and our parents age. Our parents often have needs of our time that are different than they are when we're young adults. Think of our children if we have them. I think of avocations. And one of the things that I want to make sure that you come away with is that it's important to have other things that you love to do outside of work. And I don't care what it is, but it's important to have things that you enjoy doing because it gives you greater fulfillment yourself. Don't forget to put yourself on the to-do list. And when you think about work-life balance, self has to take a place on that list. And I think about work accomplishments. This is not just about what I'm doing away from work, but it has to do with what I am doing at work as well. 
And then work relationships, which is often left out when we think about work-life balance, but we're going to come back to that. And then unmet goals. We all have goals that we're trying to meet. And sometimes we're struggling to get through those goals to fruition. OK. Now, when I think about definitions, I think about individual issues and universal concepts. So work-life balance is important whether you're male or female. It's important at every age. It's important whether you're single, married, have a partner, don't have a partner, have children, don't have children. It's really a universal impact. However, I think about also about how home impacts work and how work impacts home. And I chose an example of somebody who has a child where I can't manage to work if my child is sick or if my child is in a need. And one could take that a step further and say, well, unless I have an appropriate support system at home who can take over when I'm not there. So there are some times that home impacts work, and there are other times when work impacts home. And the example that I use here is, help, I can't manage to work with that, and then fill in the blank. My supervisor, my colleague, my staff, my student, and they make me so unhappy that it spills into everything else that I do. That is something we don't talk about enough because there are workplace conflicts that can occur with you and other people in your circle. Okay, what are we not going to talk about? We're not going to talk about academic process today. We're doing a dossier talk in June. So how do you write your personal statement for your dossier? And we're not really going to talk about networking, although we're trying to change the culture at the medicine, School of Medicine and the affiliated hospitals so that we have much more networking opportunities, much more interactions. What are we going to talk about? We're going to spend about 20 minutes talking about some rules, regulations, things that you may not know about, or places to get information. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about work-life balance, and then I'm going to bring um, Andrea up here, and we're going to have a dialogue, and we're going to talk about things, and we'll have a dialogue with everybody who's here, too, because it's a small group. We're going to talk about complaints, grievances, and dispute resolution. We're going to talk a little bit about some official policies, particularly stop the clock, family and maternity leave, child care, and tie-ins. Most of that is for people with children, but it also impacts on illness. And there are rules and time off for illness within your family that doesn't have to be you or your children. And then we're going to talk about work-life balance, strategies to improve productivity, and really trying to get at do what you want to do when, sort of, you want to do it. So we all know that time constraints sometimes prevents us from doing what we want to do exactly when we want to do it. But that's what we strive for. So I want to remind all of you and let me see if I have a link up. Um, I don't think I have a link up today. Uh, but there, there are websites where you can get information. And in particular, I want to alert you to the David Geffen School of Medicine diversity website. And I want to highlight that uh, we have links. We have links to the UCLA call. We have links to gender equity. We have links to affirmative action issues. We have links to work-life balance on the internet. So we have a lot of links from our website that will help you uh, gain additional information. Also, the UCLA diversity website. So there's a UCLA diversity website and a David Geffen School of Medicine website. Uh, my website directs you to their website for a lot of these issues, but in particular, um, there are resources, and I want to highlight resources for filing grievances and complaints. Most faculty don't think about grievances and complaints, but it tremendously can impact on your um, activities. There are resources available to you, and those resources include the Gender and Power Abuse Committee, which is of the School of Medicine, they can discuss concerns with you both informally and confidentially and give you suggestions of how to resolve your situation and what resources might be available to you. 
And then there are other official ways of going about if you have a grievance or a complaint. And so those are bound by things such as the Faculty Code of Conduct or APM, Academic Personnel Manual. You can find that on the internet. You can find that through the websites that I just told you about. Um, 015 talks about the Faculty Code of Conduct. If you think that there is a dispute that is so egregious that it rises to the level of a code of conduct violation, then you want to go to the Academic Senate Grievance Advisory Committee. You don't want to go to your HR office in your department. HR is not the right place to start with grievances. It triggers certain buttons that you don't want to necessarily trigger. But you do want to get advice. So you can go to the GAC committee through the Senate of the UCLA, or you can go to the Ombuds office. The first place you should go to, though, is your department. Figure out what policies your department has in place. And if there are individuals in your department who you can speak with confidentially about a conflict. You may not want to speak with anybody in your department. Your department may be small. You worry about your complaint or grievance getting out. You don't have to start at your department in that case. But if you feel comfortable, depending upon who the conflict is with, you can start with your division chief, your chair, or your academic personnel office, not HR. HR is for staff. Academic personnel office is for professors. And that can be <clears throat> either in your own department or in the medical school. And remember, you always have the right to consult with GAC or the ombudsperson. So I already told you about GAC. Let me just mention the ombudsperson. How many people know we have an ombudsperson here at CHS for School of Medicine? Okay, so about half of the people know that. So Tom Kosakalski is an amazing a uh, person, he's trained as an attorney, he's been trained as a mediator, he's been an ombuds person for many years. When you walk into the ombuds office, it's totally confidential. They do not keep any records of your discussion. There is no paper transaction made. They don't keep records. It is totally confidential. And he can provide you with information about how to proceed. Okay. The GAC committee, which I already told you about a little bit, is an academic senate committee, and it can help determine where your complaint should go. And your complaint can go to one of two committees of the academic senate, the charges committee or the committee on privilege and tenure. If it goes to charges, it's really an issue with faculty code of conduct. You think that a faculty is doing something outside of the code of conduct? If you are concerned that you are being blocked for promotion or somebody is interfering with your ability to do your work and, and, and excel academically, it goes to Committee on Privilege and Tenure. Now, the, our, the Academic Senate is a wonderful resource. But if you're looking for a prompt resolution, they operate a little bit more on geologic time than other sorts of avenues that you can take. <clears throat> My recommendation is start within your department to try to resolve minor conflicts or start with the ombudsperson to find out what your opportunities are. The Senate committees are excellent, but it takes a longer time to get through it. Okay, so then let me just spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the official work-life policies or family-friendly policies that you may be aware of, you may not be aware of. You get the details by looking at the call. So when do we need extra time? Maybe extra time away from work or extra time uh, during our initial eight years and as, a, as an assistant professor before we go out for promotion. Certainly childbearing and child rearing, personal illness or family illness. When we look at why people choose not to go into academics, so people, in this case it's PhDs. Marianne Mason is a professor 
of, um, and the co-director of the Center for Economics and Family Security at Berkeley. And she's done a lot of studies. You can look her up. She's done a lot of studies on issues that pertain to why people choose different paths. Training is the decision time that scientists decide what they want to do. It's also the decision time that medical physicians decide what they want to do. And there's been a shifting away from being a research professor for both men and women, more for women than men, but it affects both. And when they ask them what the top reasons are why students change their mind about what career trajectory to take, four out of five of the top cited reasons were career life issues. So we actually have an obligation as faculty to try to figure this out so that our younger colleagues will choose careers or will be able to choose fulfilling careers that they wanted when they started out that involve academia and allow them to have the life that they'd like to have as well. When we look at pipeline and leaky, leaks in the pipeline, family formation, marriage and childbirth is the largest leak in the pipeline between a receipt of a PhD and acquisition of tenure for women in the sciences. So when do you need some leave? So this is spelled out in the Academic Personnel Manual or the APM. And this is system-wide policy for UC. It's maintained by the Office of the President, so you may want to familiarize yourself with the rules. So there's APM 710, which is leave of absence and sick leave. APM 715, which are leaves of absence um, for your own health condition, for care of your children, parent, spouse, or domestic partner with a serious health condition, or for care of a newborn child or a child newly placed with you for adoption or foster care. So is family leave paid or unpaid for academics? Well, usually in professorial tracks, unless, is anybody here at the VA? OK, so for anybody who might stream from the VA and might be listening in, at the VA, everybody accrues sick leave, everybody accrues vacation, and you have to take it when you're gone from the VA. At the other institutions, and I'm not sure about the county, I would imagine the county rules are changing because of some of the issues that they had with accountability. But here at UCLA, people aren't tracking our, the time that we're away. They're not tracking our sick leave. But if you're going to be gone for an extended period of time, you should use this rule. And that is that the chancellor or designee may approve leave with pay, with pay for up to 12 w weeks. And that's really important. Now, in the medical school with the different compensation plans, you need to check with your department Usually this applies to base pay and not some of the extra pay that we might get. Now for childbearing leave, academic senate members, so if your title is in residence or full uh, or clinician X, then you're an academic senate member, you're entitled to your base salary, base salary for six weeks and some additional compensation depending upon campus policy. So you have to check with your academic personnel office in your departments. What if you're non-academic senate? Your health sciences clinical, for example, your adjunct? Um, well, if you're a woman, don't get pregnant for three months because <laughs> you have to have worked here for 12 consecutive months and then you'll receive the same benefits. Okay, So they get the same benefits, but they have to have been here for 12 months. And childbearing leave can be extended if the individual is certified disabled. You can also take 12 weeks of unpaid leave according to APM 715. So you can have time away. Now what about leave without pay? So APM 760 talks about leave without pay and it can be up to one year to care for the child of a sp you or the spouse or domestic partner. 760 does a lot of other things, and one of them is active service modified duties. Now, 
if you're providing health care and as a clinician, it's a little bit tougher to organize active service modified duties. If you're teaching in the college, for example, on the North Campus, what you can ask for is a reduction in your teaching duties for this time period, and they um, will have to make other arrangements. In terms of Health Sciences Compensation Plan member, you will receive pay no less than your approved base monthly salary, but additional compensation is variable and according to campus policies, and you need to give people notice. You can't like show up and say, oh, I'm going to be gone tomorrow for the next three months, um, except under you know, instances of, of extreme illness. Um, clock. If you have a child and you are responsible for 50% or more time of care for that child, then you can extend your clock up to one year for each event. So each time you have a child, you can extend the clock by one year twice during those eight years. So if you have five children during the eight years, you can have two years. If you have twins, you get one year for the twins. So you don't get to take two years for twins. Um, but you have to ask for that clock stoppage within two years of giving birth or placement of a child for foster care or for adoption. So everybody understand? So if your child is two years and one day and you decide, I want to stop the clock, it's too late. So you need to think about it, but you don't have to do it right when you have a child. You can do it later on. Okay. After you've past your eight-year review, and this says post-tenure. Tenure is only for full-time FTE. If you're in residence, you're in the Academic Senate, but when you go through to associate professor, it's still not considered tenure. But you can ask for deferral of personnel reviews, and you shouldn't be disadvantaged. There are rules about not being disadvantaged. Okay. And two minutes on child care, and then let's get to the rest of the talk. Um, there are different child care facilities at UCLA. Some of them are oversubscribed, and some of them you're on waiting lists for a long period of time, but you need to be aware of them. And that is here at UCLA, UCLA Child Care Services, the Infant Development Program and University Parents Nursery School. There is an outreach coordinator here at UCLA who can help you identify potential off-campus child care opportunities. And last year, we had the opening of Bright Horizons. Does anybody have a child in Bright Horizons here? We had one last night, and they just raved about it. Uh, for people in health sciences, uh, you know where it is? It's on top of Ralph's, across the street, so you get to pick up your child and pick up dinner at the same time. Um, but more importantly, they're open from 6.30 in the morning until 6.30 at night, which is much more conducive to people working in the lab although it might force you to go home at 6 at night, but, um, but it does. it is open for 12 hours a day. Now, the other thing is, and this just started a couple of years ago, is tie-ins, Together in Education and Neighborhood Schools. This is not something that people have utilized very much in, from the medical school, but this guarantees your child a spot in a school, in a uh, LAUSD school that's nearby. And that's for elementary, middle, and high school. Um, the deadline's March. So we're past the deadline for this September. But if you're thinking about using this a year from September, be aware that that's an opportunity. One other opportunity that I want to make you aware of that people might not know, and I'm sorry for the men. This is only for the ladies in the room. So, and that's sort of discriminatory, isn't it? Uh-oh, I'm taped. So this is a program. This is called Travel Child Care Awards. And this is for female postdoctoral scholars and assistant professors in health, science, and technology. This was started um, a year or two ago. And each year, there's 25 awards available in the amount of $500 each. And the eligible divisions are engineering, life sciences, physical sciences, public health, dentistry, medicine, nursing, and social sciences. 
There's a three-page application. We had a number of faculty do this last year, and they thought it was amazing. It will allow you to purchase additional child care for you at home while you go to your meeting. It will allow you to purchase a plane ticket for your child when you go to the meeting. It will allow you to purchase child care at the meeting for your child so that you can attend the meeting with your child and about six other different things. So on their application, and this is available on the website through faculty.diversity.ucla.edu. That was the general diversity website. Anybody in this room use this last year? And how did it work? Great. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. Thank you very much. Really great. <laughs> wonderful. And so we need to get the word out. They only have 25 of these, but last year I think the uh, majority came from the School of Medicine, which is really wonderful because um, for those of you um, who have children, it can be very stressful to try to go to meetings and um, figure out what you're doing with the kids. Okay, let's move on. Can I, can, let me have you introduce yourself. Okay. My name is uh, Ooh, I'm gonna have to get you near a mic. Do I need to move over? Yeah. Um, I think you can actually come right here and you'll be picked up, yes? Okay, great. You can come join me, because now we're gonna do the rest of this together. My name is Andrea Hevener. I'm an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology. And my research is focused on um, the early uh, molecular mechanisms of type 2 diabetes. And Lynn and I have established a relationship over the last year um, simply by me attending these sorts of um, meetings. And so um, I think if this is really beneficial um, not only for your personal well-being, but there's other sessions that have also been really helpful um, in promoting uh, your career, and um, and so I think uh, this is a really uh, valued um, course for um, people that uh, want to do better in their science and also at home. So I we appreciate Lynn's efforts, and I think we should applaud her in that regard. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, it's a lot of fun. These topics are a lot of fun. So we're going to talk. I'm going to raise some issues. We're going to ask for comments and we're going to discuss them. So that's, that's going to be the, and, and, and Andrea is terrific for coming. She did not know some of the topics, but she knew the general gist of it. So the rest of the time we have a half an hour to talk about work-life balance of the other sort that we are talking about. And the first thing that I would say is that you have to achieve clarity. And by clarity, I mean, what is your priority? What are your visions? And what's the time frame? So for example, if you're an assistant professor coming in, what is most important to you at work? How are you going to prioritize all the different tasks and duties that you're asked to do? And how are you going to achieve that in a doable time frame? Focus on what's important. Be explicit about prioritizing. So, for example, if you were, because you've risen up the ranks, but at one point you were an assistant professor, and when you came in you had a vision of what you wanted to accomplish in the lab. How did you balance the duties and responsibilities in the lab with things that you were asked to do, say, by your department? Did you, ever have, an Did you have a, ever have a time that your department asked you to join committees or to participate in reviews or search committees at with, and, and times where you were maybe writing a grant? Right. So how do, you, how do you strike that balance? <laughs> I don't know that you get to strike a balance when, when it gets heated in that regard and you're asked to do a lot of things. I think, um, like Lynn said, you need to be very efficient. I always, each morning or in the evening, I make um, notes for myself of things I need to achieve in a day. I keep a very tight calendar. I think being organized and then delegating when you need to your, to your postdoctoral fellows or your support staff. And I think that was a hard thing for me to learn was to delegate because I'm such a type A personality who want to control everything and I don't think there's enough hours in the day for you to be able to do everything yourself. Um, there were certain times where I was asked to assist other uh, faculty members in um, scientific projects, and so I had to work a lot of weekends and a lot of hours, and at that point in time as assistant professor, I didn't have a child, so I had the luxury, and my husband is in the military and travels quite a lot, so I 
I think, you know, I, I think you realize that at certain points in your career you're going to have to sacrifice and you may not have balance, but then when you do have time, you reestablish that balance and reestablish your home life and time with your children. So I think it fluctuates, you know, depending upon your stage. Um, so I would say just be as organized as possible and delegate when you can. Um, and sometimes my husband taught me this, and being a perfectionist, it was hard for me to say that sometimes certain tasks that were asked of me, I could do an 80% effort and it still was better than most. And so you don't ha always have to give for every task 100% effort um, to achieve the, you know, the end goal. Sometimes, you know, 80, 50% effort may be, even be sufficient. And so I hate to say yeah. that, but maybe that's No, I think helpful. that's reasonable. Okay. There's a concept of being good enough. Being good enough. There are certain things that need to be absolutely perfect, and you need to be 100% compulsive about making sure that every single thing is perfect. But there's this other concept of good enough. And sometimes uh, the difference between good enough and absolutely perfect is this asymptote. And we can spend an unlimited amount of time getting from that good enough to that what we consider to be perfect. And was it productive for you to do that or not? Um, maybe you should have gotten that paper out when it was at that good enough stage because now you've gotten scooped by somebody because you've been sitting on the data right. waiting for that perfection stage. So that would be in the scientific arena. In the medical arena, uh, I'm writing a review article. We're going to talk about review articles in a minute. I rarely do this. I don't, I don't think that they are as productive a use of your time. Um, they're wonderful to have. They get cited a lot. You get asked to give talks because of them. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do them. But you should carefully consider which ones you're going to do. But I'm on that asymptote. And I just said, well, you know, it is due on Friday. And it will be in on Friday. And we're done. Right. And so that's, you just have to draw the line. Maybe learning hard versus soft deadlines as well. You know, when some people say, oh, this is when I need it. Sometimes they'll give you a little flexibility. Obviously, grant deadlines, it's a hard deadline. But I think understanding that, and that was something I needed to really learn as an assistant professor, you know, what you can um, delay a little bit longer, ask for additional time, and that might help. And that's good. Don't be the person who turns things in late. If you feel that you need to turn something in late, and it really needs that time, that's OK. But call them and say it's going to be late. Otherwise, it's just going to be in the back of your mind, taking up space and using energy that you need for doing other things. So we're going to talk about this. Give each sequential task your full attention. So multitasking may not be the most effective solution. So as I'm, I, maybe I shouldn't admit this on tape, as I'm driving to UCLA and I'm texting on my cell phone, <laughs> which I should not do, and I'm trying to give that up. I have to go into like a 12-step program or something for texting. I'm almost, I'm almost done. I'm almost not texting at all. But there are occasions, especially when I'm at stoplights, when I get out that Blackberry. <clears throat> but I'm not giving my full attention to the road, and I'm certainly not giving, <clears throat> sorry, my full attention to what I'm texting. And sometimes that automatic spell check changes something that I'm texting. And if I hit that send, and it says something really bizarre. Actually, I heard that there's a whole book on how words are changed in texting. And sometimes it can actually be very dangerous, because if it's going to a boss or a supervisor, it will change words into inappropriate words at sometimes. But um, I'm not giving my full attention to either task. So you can do multiple things sequentially. But if you're trying to do multiple things simultaneously, it can be challenging. We think that we are accomplishing a lot, but we might not be. So I want to encourage you to identify snippets of time to be productive. And during that snippet of time, devote yourself to that task. That was a hard one for me to learn because I felt, you know, pulled apart by phone calls and emails. And so I pretty much don't answer my phone. And a lot of people complain about that. And I only respond to emails at certain times. And a lot of times I'll respond to emails late at night after I put my son down because I can do that at home. 
And so I only use the work time for things I absolutely have to do in the laboratory or contact time with my postdoctoral fellows. And anything I can do at home late at night, I do at home. And that way you become really efficient. And, you know, I don't eat lunch. Uh, I give that up. And I don't spend a lot of time in situations where I know I'm going to get forced into conversations that get long and drawn out. I just don't have that kind of time, unfortunately, because I have a two-year-old and I want to spend time with him. So I think prioritizing that and, and not putting yourself in positions where you're scattered or you know, getting into an environment where you can be focused and really, really productive and optimize that you know, small amount of time you get to do, write a paper or do your scientific experiment or meet with your fellows. I think that's really, you know, creating those optimal situations and creating those environments for yourself is really, really critical. And so what I would argue is that you need to look at your total time available in a day. I know some people who must have 30 hours in a day. I mean, they just must. But I still only have 24 hours in a day. So I look at my total time, and I actually carve out and plan time for work, time that I'm going to shut the computer, even if I'm in the middle of something that I thought I needed to finish today, if it's not critical that it gets finished today. If it's critical, you know, I'm up all night. But if it's not critical to get done today, and it took me a little bit longer, then I still shut it down because I need, and it's taken me decades to get to this point, but I need downtime. I need some time between work and sleep, like at least a few minutes, but, but I'm sort of joking. That was supposed to be a joke, but, um, but you really need to have work, family, play, avocation time. You need to carve out, you need to put yourself on that list. Okay, don't sm sweat the small stuff, putting all your ducks in a row, don't sweat the small stuff. What deserves your attention? You already talked about email. How many people feel enslaved to email? I wake up in the morning and the first thing I do in my bathroom is I put the Blackberry on and I say, you know, oh no, I got 20 new emails overnight. Luckily a lot of them are garbage, but some of them aren't. Now, Emergencies should be emergencies for you. But sometimes we respond to emergencies for other people. Now, there are appropriate times to do that. Your friend is putting in a grant, and they needed your letter of collaboration, and they forgot, and can you do it today? And of course, you're going to say yes. There are other times when people perceive that there's an emergency because they forgot to do something, or they neglected to do something, or they just thought of something and need your input on. You can look at that and judge, is this truly an emergency? Do I need to respond today or now? Or at night, hold everything till night? Or can I tell them, I understand that you're in a bind, but I see that it might be Thursday. I see your deadline is until Monday. I will get this to you, but I need to get this to you tomorrow. I can't do it today. And I think that courtesy email, most reasonable people will respond and say, yeah, that's fine. And that's what I do quite often is I ask, you know, can I turn it in next Tuesday instead? Will that meet your deadline or your needs? And oftentimes people will say yes. So I think that, you know, just that courtesy email asking or telling them when you can deliver is really important. And that should suffice. So. So don't let the squeaky reel run your life. We all feel like hamsters on the wheel, I think. Do we? I do. Or I've had those times in my life where you're always feeling like you're just running and maybe you're even just staying in place, running as fast as you can. But make sure that you identify what the important things are and get those done. And the small things or things that aren't as important, you still have to get them done, but you can get them done more on your own time frame. Invest in yourself. I have been guilty of not investing in myself at many different times in my life. Know when you need a break. Take care of your health. Achieve your outside passions. And you'll find that if you're happier with what you're doing outside of life, whatever it is, whether it's children, whether it's friends, whether it's your parents or family, whether it's your spouse, whether it's a significant other, whether it's bowling or scuba diving. You have to invest and achieve your passions because you're going to be happier at work and you're actually going to be more productive at work. 
There's a lot of studies that show that work productivity depends on your being centered and grounded. And oftentimes, and I've been as guilty as this as anybody, I'm running so fast just to keep up at work that I forget about those things. And what happens is that I don't really get as far as I thought I did, I, or as fast as I thought I did. Okay, so this is a quote from our Dean Emeritus, Dr. Levy. And I did a leadership course a few years ago. I had the opportunity, was required to interview the dean. And so I interviewed the dean, and we talked about lots of things, and he's a man of great wisdom. But this, to me, was the most important thing, and this highlights what we just have been talking about. There's always time to think. We are often being asked to make decisions on a snap basis. How many times have you been in the hallway, and a colleague comes by and says, I'd like you to be part of this committee. Can you join it? Or I'd like you to go to this meeting and present for me. Will you do it? Or your chair comes and you say, I want you to be on this search committee. And by the way, it's starting you know, in an hour. Or I want you to be on this scientific review committee. You get the email that says, I want you to be on this scientific review committee. And your temptation is to make a decision and say yes. Usually, it's hard for us to say no. It's hard for all of us to say no. But it may not fit into what your needs are at that moment. It may not be important for your trajectory. It may be important because you want to satisfy your boss or your division chief or your department head. Or it may be so time consuming that you know you're not going to get your grant in. I'm going to accept this and I won't get my grant in on time. And so, even if somebody wants your answer that moment, there is always time to think. You can say to them, this is a great opportunity. Thank you so much for giving it to me. What time or when would you need my decision? I, I need to reflect on this. I think that's an important point. I think you, all, you always have time to think. And I would say never act with emotion and uh -oh. always ask, um, under these situations, if you can check your calendar and always be thinking about what are your priorities and what do I really need to get done and does this really serve me? At certain times in your career, you can't be as giving of your time as others. And so when you're an assistant professor, you've got you know, basically six years to get that promotion and productivity is key. And so if that's your you know, primary thing to be focused on, papers and getting grants, then community, uh, community service or sitting on committees and doing these extra things aren't going to really get you to the end goal. And so you always have to keep that goal in mind, I think. So asking for time to think about it and really weighing the pros and cons of you know, doing some of this work. I review a lot for NIH. That is quite time consuming. But if you think through you know, which study sections to sit on and who you might be able to meet and really you know, weigh the pros and cons and see if that's going to help you reach that end goal, then I think you, know, you can make a better decision. But answering right away, and they tell you this in the negotiation class that we took um, a few months ago, I think it was offered, that always take time to think. And I think that's a really important thing, and Dr. Levy is right on, and I learned that from Lynn. So I think, I think that's really important you know, to always have that it, it, on your desk somewhere so that you remind yourself when someone calls to ask for that time to think. Comments, questions? You guys can chime in any time. You have a lot of, there's a lot of wisdom in this audience. So, work-life balance. Track your time. So, there's a lot of ways of tracking your time. What, and I'm just going to give you two suggestions. One is, we're often, un, well, I am often unrealistic about how long it's going to take me to do something. Anybody else have that problem? So I'm preparing a lecture, and I think, oh, I'll get that done tonight. But in reality, I perseverate on it, and it takes me eight hours to do it. Or I'm writing a paper, and sometimes I overestimate, sometimes I underestimate. And I remember last year I had a paper that came back for a revision, and I was so swamped by work, and I was so bummed out that I had to do this revision that I actually put it in this like pending pile and it kept buzzing in my mind thinking I got to get to that I got to get to that taking up wasting space in my brain thinking about having to do this revision two months later because it usually get like 60 days right 
or 90 days, depending upon the journal. I like getting up to the deadline, and I open up what they asked me for. And they asked me to do about five minutes of work. I spent hours stewing about this without sitting down and really looking at it and getting it in. And had I just looked at the thing initially and spent the, it might have been a half an hour, I would have gotten it in, I would have been done. The other thing that I do, and then I want to hear what you do in terms of tracking time is, how many of us at the end of a busy day feel that we've gotten nothing accomplished? You know, we've worked all day, we've worked hard all day, but at the end of the day we think, I didn't do anything, what, you know, what, what was I doing? So the, my strategy, and I have two different strategies. I used to make lists with check off boxes and check off the list. Um, now I do something differently because I kept losing my list. Now I actually have uh, on my you have a BlackBerry. Come I know on, my BlackBerry. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, I, that's true. Leave that's true. Voice message. But I actually do it on Stickies on the Mac. Okay. Do you know the program Stickies? I have a running to do list on Stickies, and I've got the deadline, the date that you know the drop dead deadline on it. And what I do is I actually keep a done file. So I have my do file and I have my done file. So whenever I'm feeling low and I feel like I didn't accomplish anything, I look at what I've done. And sometimes that helps me realize what I actually have accomplished. Yeah, uh, I, I, have a, I guess I have a problem with this in that sometimes, you know, especially when you're writing a paper, you get distracted in the literature, or maybe if you're an MD, you get distracted by other colleagues stopping you in the hall or these types of things. I always try to make sure that I stay focused and moving things forward. And I'm saying to myself, if I'm not moving it forward to get to that end goal, then I need to stop whatever I'm doing and reprioritize and make sure that you know, what I'm doing isn't wasted time. And so I'm always checking myself because, I, you know, when I didn't have a child and my husband was traveling, I could just stay in the lab all night long. And you could sit there and do PubMed searches all night long and work on papers. But I think now keeping the focus, keeping, you know, your eye on the ball, so to speak, I always use sports analogies because that works for me, and, and making sure that you're on task and not getting kind of distracted from your end goal is really important. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Um, I keep lists, but I don't lose them. I have them always right there. So lists are really effective for me and always referring to those lists constantly throughout the day to make sure you're making progress. Um, and then also making sure that you're realistic with what time you do have and what tasks, how much time it does take to do a task. And I think that's something that you only learn over time, but that's really important because then you won't commit to things that you can achieve and achieve well um, that aren't going to get you to your, you know, your end game. So... So learn to say no to some things that aren't very valuable. So I talked a little bit about review articles. They're wonderful to do periodically, but if you're doing too many of them and not writing your original reports, doesn't help you. Um, leave work at work. What I mean is not that you, when you leave UCLA, you're done, because most of us carry our computers or log in at home. What I mean is that there are times that you turn off work and that you are on to home life, avocation, fun, nurturing yourself, um, that there are times that you just have to try to close it down and walk away. When you come back, especially if you're working on a difficult problem or challenging problem, oftentimes you'll get your great ideas when you've walked away from the work and you're doing something else, and then an idea pops up in your head. Or even when you sleep, sometimes I'll wake up and some idea has come in my head, I write it down, and just having that downtime away from work, and it, work is home, but you know I'm segregating what I'm doing. We talked about time management. Bolster your support system, especially in times of stress. Nurture yourself. What is it that you like to do? What is it that provides you with recharging of your batteries? And I don't care what it is going to the movies, going for a walk, exercising, spending time with friends, whatever it is, you, you, know, you have to make sure that you are doing enough of that to make sense in your life. And finally, there are times that people may need professional help. And yesterday, one of the participants is a psychiatrist, and she said, some people um, 
require therapy, but everybody can benefit from it. And so if you need professional help, get it. There's no stigma about it, but sometimes people need it with the stress in their life. There's only one thing I wanted to say, too, that kind yes. of fits along with that, is if you can learn to take the emotion out of science, take the emotion out of the rejection, or if you don't get a grant funded, or if you have a failed case or something happens, you know, if you're an MD, if you can just take a step back, take a deep breath, if maybe there's a colleague and it's a very adversarial environment, I know this happens with, you know, almost everyone in the room has a situation that they have to contend with a difficult personality. I mean, you're dealing with all type A kind of narcissistic personalities in this field. <laughs> so you're going to run across somebody where it becomes um, a problem at work. And so deal with it and make it more of a problem-solving thing. And if you can take the emotion out of it, you'll respond faster to that rejected um, or you know, that revised manuscript, or you respond better by really reading the critiques for your grant. And that's something my boss, mm -hmm. my first boss, um, when I was a postdoctoral fellow, just an outstanding individual, taught me, take the emotion out of science, you'll also be better when you get home. You'll be less inclined to get in a fight with your husband. You'll be more engaged with your child because you'll be present. If your mind's always spinning with all these problems from work or all these things you have to deal with, or your laundry list of things to do at work is too long, then you're not gonna be present and you'll be um, less productive. Scientifically, I know my mind doesn't think as well, and so you know, in order for me to be clear at work, I need to have a clear head, and so I think that was another big thing that I learned as assistant professor. You know, If something comes up and it's an you know, emotional situation, take the emotion out of it, it's always problem solving, and if you can attack it that way, I think you'll be much better off, and you'll be more inclined to do, go do fun things too, because your mental health will be in that situation where you won't want to brood at home, you want to get out there and play in the sun or go to the beach or take your child to the park or what have you. So. Great advice. So on this slide, there's one thing that we didn't talk about, and that is rethink errands. What I would encourage all of you to do, no matter at what stage you are, if there are things that are a drain on your time and a drain on your energy and you don't absolutely have to be the person to do it, find somebody else to do it and pay them to do it. It is well worth the money to never have to clean your toilet again. It is well worth the money to never have to go to the dry cleaners again. It is well worth your money to have some meals cooked for you uh, or to pick it up or to prepare something or to make the salad for you because anything that you can take away on your sort of routine duties or duties that you don't enjoy doing. If you love to cook, cook every night. But if you find that that's a drag on you and a drain on you, make five dinners on Sunday or find somebody to help you with it. Uh, really paying other people to do things that take up your time but don't add value to your life. So pay people to do things that take up your time but don't add value. And I think that we are at our end because I, probably another group needs to come in. So any questions or comments? Thank you so much Thank for you. coming. Please fill out the um, evaluations.